But when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? We ourselves by birth are not Gentile sinners, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. But if we, if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. For if I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And so that was a little long, and in your bulletins you've seen that I put it in three sections there. Um, the section on the justification, justification by faith, I'm going to cover in heavy, heavy detail in two weeks because Paul is going to give an example of that with, with Abraham. He's going to use Abraham's life as the analogy to look at. So to our text, parents, as your kids leave home, as they grow up, as they're teenagers and, and, and older, and as they perhaps go on trips and they... Uh, perhaps go off to college and they leave home. Can you all turn the timer on for me? Sorry to interrupt. I need to know or I'll go all morning. <laughs> as I said, as your kids leave home, folks, and, and you've poured into them your whole life and, and you've taught them, in a, we're covenantal people here. We teach them the things of God, as Deuteronomy tells us, teach these things to your children. We raise them. We raise them in worship in the church. We pour into them. But at some point, they got to own it for themselves. And so, so what do you tell them when they leave? Whether it be a, a, a trip for teenagers, whether it's a youth trip or a school trip, or they actually go off to college, or maybe they leave the house and they, they start their own life in their own house. They're out of your house. Are there things you want to tell them? What do you want to remind them? Would it matter? I've told you this before, and and, you know, but I'll say it again. My dad, when when I would come to those moments, and it happened a number of times, you know, what could he really say, right? I'm on my own. I could do whatever I want to do. He could heap fear on me or threaten me. He could do a lot of things, but you know what he usually did? He usually looked me in the eye and with a loving smile. Say, remember who you are. And then he'd hug me. And that just sort of meant the world because it told me I belong. It reminded me of my, the love I have and who I am. It doesn't mean I always heeded it. But we need to remember who we are. We have an identity, and we need to live out of that identity to not be in our lives a counterfeit. Because how we live portrays to the world what we believe and who we are. And as Christians, we fail up to live up to our identity as it is found in the gospel that we are a new creation in Christ Jesus all the time. Our text today, Paul calls it in verse 14, 
that he saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, was not in line with the truth of the gospel. The gospel communicates something about what it means to be a Christian, and Peter and these, these other followers were not in line with that. This can happen in two ways. In one way, it can be because we revert back to our old identity. In other words, we do things that are contrary to the gospel. Old habits die hard. And it also can happen when we don't stand up for the truth of the gospel when we're called to. In other words, it happens when we act in ways that we shouldn't act and when we don't act in ways that we're supposed to act, particularly in defense of or proclamation of or speaking the gospel when we're supposed to. It's called hypocrisy. Why do we trade our identity in Christ for these counterfeit identities? What's the motivation behind that? What's the drive behind that? And how do we get a gospel-centered motivation to so love our new identity in Christ that we live out of that truthfully? I said we're in Galatians because I want us to be crystal clear this summer and moving forward on what the gospel is and what it is not. I want us to be able to identify counterfeit gospels because the church has gotten this all mixed up in America. Whether it's the religious right or the conform to the culture left, not the gospel. All that tries to add to God's work in Christ, which is for salvation for all who believe. Without precondition. Just faith. In John 1.12, it says, To all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to have a new identity, to be children of God. In Acts 10, it says, Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. In Romans 3.22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. No other condition. In Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. This new identity, because we all come into this new identity by the same way, by faith, for all who believe, regardless of Jew, Gentile, regardless of socioeconomic status, creates unity, true unity, Acts 2.44. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. This is the gospel Paul received from the Lord and was confirmed by the apostles, but he finds out that people now are adding to this gospel. The book of Galatians refers to them as Judaizers, or we call them Judaizers because it talks about the Jewish believers, the circumcision party, trying to Judaize the Gentiles. The Jews were, after all, the ones that received the law and all the oracles of God, and they had the old covenant. And if God is one, those things must still hold. And so you Gentile believers, we're glad you are one of the all who believe, who have faith, but you're not doing it right. Particularly, you must eat kosher, you must maintain the Jewish uh, dietary laws, you must be circumcised, which would be hard for adult men to go through, obviously. Maintain the Jewish Sabbath, which is on the seventh day of the week in the way that the Jewish people prescribe. You do that because that's what true believers do. Ever heard that anywhere? I don't know that in this church, knowing what I know about this church, that we have any 
Jewish converts into Christianity. But the South, as we all know, have their own set of traditions and rules that Christians are supposed to do. And if they don't, they're second-class, second-tier Christians. And you know the list. Paul says that is a different gospel. It's not in line with your new identity in Christ because it creates division and separation and gives the appearance that there's a superiority for one group of Christians and an inferiority for another group of Christians because of what the Christians are doing. Paul says this is so serious in chapter 1 that if someone is guilty of it, they should be accursed, anathema, which is damned. Paul says that if even an angel or an apostle comes with a different message, those two categories, because that's the categories of the Old Testament and the New Testament, because the Old Testament, they had this belief that the angels gave the writers, we would call it the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the things that they wrote in the Scriptures. And the New Testament, that came by inspiration of the apostles. Paul says even if the apostles of Old and New Testament come now with a different message, be discerning enough to recognize it is a different message. It is a change. Let them be accursed. You say, wow, why would the apostles come with a different message? That's crazy. Well, Paul shows you there in verses 11 to 14, that's what happened with Peter. That's why he's going to this now. He said that in chapter 1. Now in chapter 2, he's telling you the preeminent apostle, the Lord's best friend, Peter, who Christ says, I give you emblematically of the church the keys to the kingdom, was teaching a false gospel by his life. I mean, this is explosive. Peter and Paul fighting publicly? What would possess Paul? He's the new guy. Peter walked with the Lord for years. Best friend. Because Paul views it as that serious. What was Peter's sin and his crime? Did he teach something contrary to the gospel? Did he say, you must do this now? Did he say, I was wrong, this is the new twist? Peter's crime was not that his teaching had changed. And Peter's crime was not that he believed anything different. Peter's crime and offense against the gospel was that he lived in a way that was hypocritical to what the gospel was. And Paul says in chapter 1, that's the same thing as deserting God. That to believe the truth... But to live to give the impression of something different is desertion. In verse 17 it says, If if in our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. In other words, if we know that we are saved by grace through faith, but we live in a different way, is Christ who saved us going to be a servant for us? in our salvation. In Romans 6, it says, may it never be. You don't sin so that grace may abound. That's what, that's what it means. And that communicates a false gospel. You've heard that actions speak louder than words, and this is what happens. So important to get. The issue here is not that Peter was a racist. That's what people will say. The Judaizers may have been, but Peter loved the Gentiles. Paul says it. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. Verse 12, for before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. He loved his new freedom in Christ. Big theme for Galatians. The text tells you why Peter did it. Out of fear, and he became a hypocrite. Because he regarded more important the opinions of man than God. Just like the Pharisees in Jesus' time. And Paul says then he is misrepresenting the gospel in his actions. Not living in line with or in step with the truth of the gospel. That, that phrase in step with or in line with is, is, is a Greek word orthopoduson. The poduson in some languages, poder, is to walk. 
and ortho is upright or straight. Straight walking. That's where we get the word orthopedic from. To straighten. In other words, what Paul says here is that our orthodoxy, orthodox, what we believe to be true, must translate into our orthopraxy, how we practice or live life. We need straight doctrine, orthodoxy, and straight living, orthopraxy. Otherwise, we're giving the appearance that coming to Christ requires something else or that Christ doesn't care about sin or it's okay to create division when the gospel really creates unity. In this case, that Jewish Christians are better than Gentile Christians. The gospel is not Jesus plus be Jewish, Jesus plus be circumcised, Jesus plus associate with the right people, Jesus plus play the right music at worship, wear the right clothes to church. False gospels. Things that create, here, here, here's, here's the crux here, right? What do these things create? Division. And yet, if we all have one identity, what are we supposed to be? United. It is the gospel of Jesus Christ that is the only force and power in the world that unites people. Everything else divides. Every other philosophy and world system is divisive. This is why intersectionality, critical race theory, cultural Marxism are evil. Because it creates and perpetuates separation, not reconciliation. It creates racism in the name of anti-racism, intolerance in the name of tolerance. Let me say before anybody, racism is a sin. And there are some systems in society that have systemic racism. And we should look at those. I say that because I'm not speaking against the, that, 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 that truth exists. I know racism exists and an evil is evil. Y'all know I'm from a Middle Eastern descent, and while I might be viewed as a second-rate minority, there's no box for me to check. I told you in my childhood when I was eating foods at lunch because I grew up in a household that spoke Arabic. I went to a church that was all in Arabic. I knew my grandparents on both sides that were from Syria. They made fun of me. Until a kid stuck up for me. And that's what Christians are called to do. I've had slurs leveled at me because of my appearance as a kid, because of various ethnic features that I won't highlight. I remember what it was like after 9-11 for Arab Americans in this country. My cousin, who's the same height as me, same complexion as me, same look as me, same ethnic features as me, had the FBI called on him and knocked on his house door just because of who he was. I've had jokes about me, about looking like a guy on the FBI most wanted list and a picture put up in the office because it was funny. I've been called a camel jockey and the sand N-word. Of course racism exists. Here in Davidson County, my family went to a restaurant, North Davidson County. We walked in. We were not served for 15 minutes. They walked by us a number of times. We'd look at the counter. They just shrugged their shoulders. When we finally got up and walked out, my 8-year-old son at the time turned around and looked at the four staff members as they condescendingly waved and went like this. I've had one of your family members tell me that the reason y'all accept me in this church, because I was defending how wonderful and welcome you are, is because I was a good immigrant. Because I've stayed in line. So I know it exists. I understand there is racism and it's a terrible sin and antithetical to the gospel. I also know that's not what defines my life because my dad told me, remember who you are. And I had a father to do that. But understand that critical race theory, cultural Marxism, and intersectionality are evil. 
I've often heard that this Galatians 2 passage supports CRT philosophy, critical race theory. It does not. Critical race theory says that the minority group is always necessarily by de definition oppressed by the majority. If you apply that to this passage, you know who's right? Peter. Because the Jews are minorities in Antioch. 10% are Jewish in Antioch. The Jews were hated in the Greco-Roman world. And so when Peter sticks up for them, if we're using this cultural Marxist critical race theory framework, we would say, good for you, Peter, sticking up for the minorities, not only in the church, but in the culture. Not right. Why is critical race theory categorized with other critical theories as cultural Marxism? I'm not going to get too technical, but I want you to understand because I, I've heard this confusion. Marx taught that there was a perpetual struggle between the classes. And this went on forever. It would never end. And the class that is in power is always the oppressor, and the class that is under them is always the oppressed. It was an economic theory. Those in power are by definition oppressed and need to be liberated from the oppressor. And Christians would agree that oppressors need to be dealt with. But in a Marxist scheme, you just change who the oppressor is. It's a zero-sum game. There's no reconciliation or salvation in, in a Marxist scheme. CRT is cultural Marxism because it takes this economic philosophy and applies it to racial categories. It says that minority groups are always and necessarily oppressed and right. And that majority ethnic groups are always and necessarily wrong, the oppressor, and racist. It's absurd. Because in this framework, we would be led to believe that Barack Obama and LeBron James's kids are oppressed. And all of the middle class people in here are the oppressor and privileged. Not the gospel. It says that people in minority groups are not responsible for their actions because they are the product of their environment. It demonizes good people and often makes into heroes bad people by the color of your skin. It creates a never-ending system of penance but no forgiveness. It removes all hope for reconciliation. It offers no salvation. It is a cycle of division that perpetuates racial division and has no category for unity. Not the gospel. This is the problem with the current societal movement sweeping our nation. It is evil and a false gospel. It offers no hope and it must be rejected. Similarly, intersectionality is an evil, godless, anti-gospel system. Intersectionality says how many intersections of oppression can you have so who is the oppressed? What are the categories? White, male, Christian, straight, able-bodied people. So if you have any in those categories, so females are a little oppressed. If you're a gay female, you've you got two levels. You get the point. Can't we just take the good parts and leave out the bad parts, they say. Can't we just eat the meat and spit out the bones, they say. Not when it's all bones. Pastor Harry Reeder said it like this. It's like a thirsty man trying to drink seawater and spit out the salt. It's deadly. Anything that is true in critical race theory does not originate in critical race theory. Therefore, we do not need critical race theory. I don't need critical race theory to tell me that racism exists. I've already said, personally experienced it. I've seen it. I grew up in an African-American community in North Miami. Look it up. Race riots there, yes, in the 80s. Why am I telling you this? Am I using you know, this text as a hobby issue? I'm telling you this because these are false gospels and Christians have been taken captive by these philosophies just like these Judaizers are doing. This is the problem. We're, we're not worried about somebody telling, 
somebody, you need to be circumcised now. What we're hearing is you must do this, otherwise you're a second-class Christian. Get on board this thing. It's robbing people of their joy. I've seen multicultural, multi-ethnic churches completely split over this. Creating division, not unity. They're finding our way into our churches. They're finding, I mean, it's being taught in the schools. We need to understand it. It has everything to do with our text today because it's acting in ways that add to the gospel of Jesus Christ, making people feel separated rather than united, seeking division rather than unity, and the gospel doesn't play favorites. There's no partiality in the gospel. The gospel unites. We should seek unity. Start with your neighbors, personally. Everybody wants to jump on movements. Do you have any coworkers that are not like you? you can move to, toward like, like Christ would. Putting a badge on your Facebook page does nothing. But now, you, whew, now I won't get accused of being a racist. I put that thing on there. Paul points us to the gospel for why Peter's actions are wrong. And he talks about justification by faith. And he even says... In verse 16, yet we know, he reminds them what they know, including Peter, that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This great doctrine I will be teaching on in so much detail in two weeks because Paul will show that you could even see this in the Old Testament. But what I will say is Paul is using forensic language, judicial categories to explain this. That's why in verse uh, 11 he says, Peter stood condemned. It was an odd thing to see about, say about Peter. It's because he's making the connection between judicial language of being justified. Peter, you want to return to the law? You are condemned by the law. You don't measure up. We'll talk about the law in two weeks too, but basically the Ten Commandments which summarizes the moral law of God condemns us. It's like we're in a trial, in a court hearing, and there's only two verdicts you're going to get. Guilty, you guys want to say not guilty. Righteous. See, it's not an American judicial system where just because you're not guilty, it doesn't mean you're innocent. In the economy of God, it's guilty or perfect righteousness. None of us have it. And the weight of the law is bearing down on us, and the judge is looking at us. And right as the the verdict is going to be announced, a man walks in the room to be your advocate and says, wait a minute, this one's mine. I paid the price for him. The judge looks at you. Is this true? Yes, I believe. Righteous. Because Jesus Christ took your sin and gave you his freedom. You get his righteousness. And then every Christian, black, brown, yellow, poor, rich, come in the same way. You get a new name. You're called a little Christ Christian. New identity. So if I have that identity and this person doesn't look me like me has this identity, doesn't it mean that we have more in common than we do difference? Don't we want to move toward these people in love? You are not actually righteous. You are declared righteous. And little by little in this life, we're being sanctified till one day we are glorified and we truly become what we have been declared to be. It's the gospel. We want to share that. Peter knew better. I mean, he had this whole vision in Acts chapter 10 about, you know, went into a trance, a a, a tablecloth came down, it had pigs and lobsters and all kinds of weird things on it, and it says, kill and eat. And Peter says, I've never had an unclean thing touch my lips. And the Lord says, do not call clean what I have made clean. And what Peter realized is this has more to do with 
people than it does to do with food. Because the Jewish dietary laws were put there to separate people. They had, God was carving for himself a people. The only way to do that would be to separate them from the pagan nations. If you can't eat together, that eliminates a lot of what you can do together. Those foods that they couldn't eat were called unclean. God is now saying, you can eat that stuff. Which meant to Peter, he could associate with the Gentiles because then God was bringing Gentiles to faith around him. And he, and he told, he says it at the Jerusalem Council, there's debate about when this happens in the context of all this, but he, he says, well, we saw that this, God gave the Spirit to them the same way he gave it to us. One way in, all who believe. It's the gospel. And so we can move toward people who aren't like us, people we view dirty, because we see in the gospel that's us, that Christ moved toward us, that we were dirty and unworthy and had habits that weren't godly habits. But in Christ, we know we're truly loved and that that person who's different than us, their ticket to heaven is the same as my ticket to heaven. His name is Jesus Christ. And because I love Christ, I want to be an agent of God's grace to others to bring more people into the kingdom, to make more people like me. Because I'm no longer me. I'm Christ. Little Christ. That is why Paul says in the last section in your bulletin that he wants to live life now. And you'll see I bolded lives and life and live multiple times. Verse 19, for through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. For I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, I live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, when we teach Scripture so often, we would do that first section as its own passage, the middle section as its own passage, and the last section as its own passage. But it, it fits together. It's an unchangeable link. Peter was living as if he was not a Christian. And Paul says, we have been crucified with Christ. We then live in Christ because of the gospel, the justification piece in the middle. Paul says that in Christ, his old self is dead. He is crucified with Christ because Christ died to redeem me from the guilt of the law, to redeem me from who I was. And if, I can, if Christ redeemed me from my sins, how can I still walk in them? That's, again, that tricky verse there. 17. The old me is dead. In Romans 6, 3, it says, those of you who have been baptized into Christ have been baptized into his death. In Philippians 1, 20, it says, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. My identity now is a Christian. It's in Christ, one who is in Christ. That's a defining identity. That's why in Philippians, Paul says, live lives worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here it says, walk in line with the truth of the gospel. We are not the gospel the gospel is what happens to us because of Jesus Christ. It's the offer of salvation that we are brought into his kingdom as part of his family, and then we live out of that citizenship and identity. What is Paul's motivation in this? Because obviously Peter didn't want to, I mean, you know, this is Peter. I love Peter. I, I just, because I see myself in him all the time. He, he always, you know, I'll say two steps forward, one step back. He's making progress, but he messes up a lot, like me. But why is Paul able, and Paul still sins too, but why is he able to have this view and this motivation? I mean, what, what empowers us to walk in the freedom of our identity in Christ? What empowers that? It's not the law, but that's what we often do. We're going to look at that next week. Well, these are the laws of God, so I'm going to do them. That's not the motivation. The motivation is not the law. The motivation is to become in practice what we've been declared to be. 
And that's why Paul says this, and that's why I stopped the text right here. As he's pondering who he is in Christ, do you see what he says? He's preaching the gospel to himself. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul stops talking about them and he starts talking about himself. Dear Christian, Christ loved you and gave himself for you. Does that change how you look at living for him? I hope so. For me, it changes everything. He loves his new identity. He won't shrink back into his own identity because he knows that's a desertion of Christ, the one who paid the price for his sins. Paul remembers who he is, but more importantly, he remembers whose he is. Remembers whose he belongs to. People in our culture today are scrambling to find and declare their own identity. And that's what these movements are about. That's why we call them identity politics, identity movements. There's, it's, it's infecting our schools at a very young age where kids are challenged on their identities. We get an identity in Christ. You're called a child of God, a daughter of the king, a son of the king, a prince and a princess in the kingdom. There's no better identity than that. We need to see the beauty of what Christ did for us who loves you and gave himself for you. 1 John 4, 9 to 11. In this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he is in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment because he is so also are we in this world there's no fear in love love casts out perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love we love because he first loved us if anyone says i love god and hates his brother he's a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he cannot see, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. That's why we seek love and reconciliation with people that are different for us. Because he loved us first. And he gave himself for us. Two more scriptures I want to look at. It says, he loved me and gave himself for me. Now you remember in the previous sec- two sections that Taylor and Pablo preached on, Paul was a persecutor of the church. Killed Christians. At least was there for that. And salvation was God's sovereign hand upon Paul's life to grab him and open his eyes. But we often think then That as we live this life now, when we sin, which is grievous and heinous, and will come to account, but that somehow loses that love that God has for us. I want to read Romans 5 a little bit, 6 to 11, which talks already, since we've been out just, we have justification by faith, we have peace with God 
Paul says this in Romans 5, 6. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one might dare die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God? For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, how much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life? What that's saying is, every sin you commit before you come to Christ and after you come to Christ doesn't change your position with Christ. Said another way, every evil, lustful, murderous thought you've ever had, Christ knew before he went to the cross. Every desire you've had, everything that you would say out of your mouth or think in your head without saying it out of your mouth, every evil thing you've looked at, every terrible thing you've did, every time you've denied him, both in practice and in word, Christ knew before he went to the cross. And then he went to the cross for the joy set before him. You guys, being with him in heaven, paying the price for those sins that you would commit even after you're his follower. It's astounding. If he saved you while you were an enemy, you came to faith while you were a sinner, like, wow, why would he rescue me? How much more will he not hold you now that he's his, even when you sin? Romans 6 says the same thing. I'm sorry, John 6 that should remove all fear. That should remove all fear. That should make us not want to live by hypocrites because it shows God's love for us, that we are so secure in him. Why would we deny him like Peter did? Peter denied him in words in, in the crucifixion, and here he's denying him in his actions. And yet Jesus loves Peter. Peter. Romans 8 to close. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation including yourself will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you don't know the love of God in Christ Jesus... Believe in him. He's that real, that faithful, and that good of a God that he will pay the price for every sin you've ever made. Trust in him. Repent and believe.